Hello and welcome to The Local Campaign. I'm Pam Seidel from City News. As you know, on October 19th, Canada will elect the 42nd Parliament and Rogers TV is the only station producing debates of all of Toronto's 25 ridings. For the next hour, you will hear from the candidates of Toronto Danforth. And before I introduce the candidates, let's take a closer look at the riding of Toronto Danforth. The riding of Toronto Danforth stretches from Lake Ontario in the south, snakes its way west and north along the Don Valley Ravine. The eastern border is Coxwell Avenue. Neighborhoods in this riding include the former borough of East York, Riverdale, Leslieville, Riverside, Monarch Park, and the Portlands. This riding is home to the East York Civic Center and Taste of the Danforth, the annual festival that celebrates Greek food and culture. NDP member Craig Scott is the incumbent MP in Toronto Danforth. And now I will give each candidate one minute to make their opening statement. This will be done in the order of most seats by party in the House of Commons. So we will begin with Craig Scott, the NDP candidate. Craig. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here tonight. It's been my privilege to have been the MP for almost three and a half years uh, since being elected in 2012. I've done my very best in the House of Commons to represent you uh, proudly and thoughtfully. I would say some of the uh, contributions I've made were the fight against the Unfair Elections Act and uh, Bill C-51, the spy state expansion bill, along with a long-term campaign to put proportional representation uh, on the map as an issue in this campaign and I hope in the next parliament. Uh, beyond that I'd like to say that uh, this is a riding that's very special. I think most MPs tend to say something like that after they've got to know uh, the people in the neighborhoods better than they could have before they were elected. But the diversity, the dynamism, uh, the sense of people looking out for each other across the riding is, is very, very special and it's been uh, frankly uh, a treat uh, to represent all of you. Thank you, Craig. Julie? Hi. I believe politics are local. As your neighbor for almost 20 years, I was asked by members of our community to be become your Liberal Party member and to be the voice for real change in Toronto Danforth. We need a strong local advocate who is present and who is responsive. We need to find solutions to our packed subway cars today. We need to find, to create new childcare spots now. We need to invest in affordable housing and the time is now. We need national leadership to fix our economy and to invest in protecting our environment. We need to have, a, a, need an honest government who's accountable, who makes decisions based on science, data, and evidence and not on ideology. I believe this to be true, Justin Trudeau believes this to be true, and the Liberal Party platform delivers what matters when it matters. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Julie. Let's move on to Chris Tolley from the Green Party. Thank you. The Green Party is fundamentally different from the big three traditional parties. We do things differently. The Green Party has bold, innovative ideas. The other parties have old, stale ideas that just continue the status quo. Uh, other parties are forced to vote along party lines. Just as an example, the NDP over the past four years, every single MP has voted in the exact same way, the way that Thomas Mulcair wants them to vote. So that means MPs like Craig Scott have voted putting the individual and the interests of the NDP before that of your interests, and that's wrong. As a Green Party MP, I would be free to vote independently, and that means my loyalty rides only with you. And that is something that's radically different in politics today. At the end, all I can say is that I urge you to look at things in a bold, brave way and to consider voting Green. Thank you very much, Chris. Let's move on to Elizabeth Abbott. I am the candidate for the Animal Alliance Environment Voters Party and my party is so small that we don't, we don't expect to win any seats 
not in this election and not until there's proportional representation. But I do have a credo that I would like to share with voters who will hopefully uh, express their, it will resonate with voters who will then take that to the polls and vote either for me or for a candidate whose views are, are similar or could be accommodated to mine. I believe in a world where human res humans respect, protect, and enhance the environment they depend on and share with animals and plant life, and where progress is measured not as macroeconomic units of growth, but always in terms of justice, equal equity, and sustainability. Our best science shows that the economic course that humanity is currently pursuing will, if left unchecked and unreformed, result in drastically altered ecosystems and catastrophic events far worse than we are already witnessing and enduring around the world. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Before we move on, I just want to mention some registered candidates who are not here tonight. Benjamin Dichter is the Conservative candidate, and John Richardson is the Progressive Canadian Party candidate. They cannot be here tonight. So let's begin our question and answer session. Our first question, we'll touch on some of the topics that you touched on, on in your opening statements. First of all, there are 350,000 children under the age of 12 in this city, 65,000 licensed child care spaces. Many parents complain about the lack of available daycare. The universal child care benefit was intended to support parental choice, but it doesn't address this issue. What will your party do about the shortage of affordable child care? Let's start with you, Craig. Well, thank you. I think uh, by now most people do know that the NDP uh, has a, a proposal that uh, would become uh, legislation working with the provinces to add uh, one million uh, child care spaces across Canada within an eight-year period. So that average is out to uh, roughly 130 to 140,000 across the country. Uh, the idea would be to be maintaining existing spaces or adding to existing spaces so that uh, parents would be paying no more than $15 a day per child. Um, so basically, it's a universal affordable child care program. It's based on the model that was successful in Quebec, and that uh, actually had major impacts, positive impacts on the economy as well. Okay, Craig, I just want to remind you all that for these, the beginning of, the, of these first questions, you only have 30 seconds. So let's hear from Elizabeth Abbott next on this. Well, I'm a grandmother, and my granddaughters are in daycare in Quebec. And I have to say that I think that's a really good model, and I would like to see that established here in Ontario. Thank you very much. Chris? Uh, I have a two and a half year old, so I know daycare quite intimately and the struggles that a lot of young parents have for uh, daycare. The Green Party wants to bring in a comprehensive daycare program that would uh, allow for free daycare for all people who are within need. Um, but at the same time, we also would like to focus on in-work daycare uh, through incentives. And what that means is that means people can take their children to work and have a daycare program with in their work if um, uh, the company is large enough. And what that means is you can maintain that connection between the parent and uh, the child. All right, thank you very much. And Julie? But our plan isn't based on having to have provincial participation as part of the plan because right now the NDP plan requires the provinces to contribute 40 percent to make available the spots for daycare. Our plan is to sit down with the provinces and to make money available through our social infrastructure program to create spots and to rely on the provinces to help us let us know what their needs are because different provinces will have different needs. Well, let us open that up to a free discussion. Feel free to debate uh, among each other. Um, Craig and Julie have differing opinions about this and all enter in on the debate. You've got four or five minutes. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting to know that uh, the Liberals believed, they said they believed in 2006 in the Universal Affordable Child Care Plan um, and uh, tried to go to the electorate with that except for the fact that Canadians weren't ready to re-elect a Liberal government and uh, now when given the chance to put it back on the table they've totally ignored it as uh, a priority. At the same time in those 10 years they've been bashing the NDP for somehow killing that program by being part of an election in which the Liberals were not elected. So I, I think people should look very, very carefully at whether or not what the Liberals are presenting is a child care plan 
or a plan to sort of tell people, here's a bunch of money you can put in your pocket, but by the way, it's not going to cover the cost of childcare in the city of Toronto. Julie, do you have oh, a response to that? Yeah. We need to differentiate because you're talking about two different things. Now, firstly, we did have a national child care plan in 2006, which we had negotiated with each of the provinces. So we had a plan. Did and the first, back? the first thing that Stephen Harper did when he took government was to axe that plan. But it was based on individual negotiations with each of the provinces. Mm -hmm. When we are talking about making a plan, it is right there in our social infrastructure investment plan. $20 billion over 10 years to cover social infrastructure, which includes childcare. And it means sitting down with the provinces. It's not proposing a plan to people that we say, we're going to do this, but oh, by the way, we have to get the provinces to agree uniformly across the country, regardless of what other plans they have in place. And provinces have already said that they are not prepared, some of them, to con contribute 40%. So, it, it's not, it's a slogan, it's not a plan until you've actually negotiated it and wrangled out the details. That's what we're planning on doing, is sitting down and creating you, you, a plan that works. Julie, you're not planning on negotiating anything resembling a universal affordable child care plan. That was uh, what you negotiated in 2006, that's what you've abandoned now. Ha I have to, sorry, I have to jump in here. Um, I, I have a kid right now who's in daycare. My career is suffering. My wife's career is suffering. There was a program on the table. It was a liberal program, and it died. And it died because of the NDP, because the NDP pulled down the Mar Martin government. And I right now would be in such a better place because of that. And yet that was done simply because the NDP felt that they could get close to power. They sensed that they were close to becoming the official opposition. And they pulled down that government, and I Chris, suffered because of craziness. it. that's craziness. The, the election was coming up in eight months. We all know why people voted against the, uh, the Liberal Party. It was deep-seated and corruption. That's why they were voted out. It had nothing to do with the NDP. It was the people of Canada voted out the Liberal Party. The NDP chose the timing. The NDP, so, the NDP chose the timing in the sense that it chose not to prop up a corrupt government in well, 2006. Let me just have my little say here and go back into history. And during World War II, uh, when women were what, at home and the men were sent out to, to war, and they need, the government realized that the, uh, the war industries needed people in the factories, they created a federal daycare program just like that. And women were put into factories and, and got good, reasonably good jobs. And babies and little kids were looked after well. And that, pr and that was in the States as well. And it was only after the war was over and the men came home, they collapsed the day care program and so on. It just seems to me that if there was a real will to do it federally, it could be done as it was in World War II. And so it was an opportunistic decision to bring down the government in 2006. Two, and 2006, so you think the NDP thought it had a chance to win power by t calling an election? Julie, that's as crazy as what Chris just said. All right. <laughs> but the issue, is, the issue is what can we do to create childcare spaces and early learning opportunities mm. now? Mm. And not in eight years, but now. Over and we are years, committed. Not in eight years, we over are committed eight years. to sitting down within a hundred days with the provincial premiers and the territories to speak about what can be done and to put funding immediately towards those plans. And you've that is an immediate plan, and it is a workable plan that doesn't rely on the provinces contributing forty percent to create those spots. And until you have the agreement of all the provinces, it's not happening. Well, I can tell you right now that the provinces, when the money is on the table, Ontario already has versions of child care, uh, all day kindergarten, et cetera, Quebec does too. When the money is there, the provinces will, sit, will find a way to work with the uh, federal government to make sure that that money is not le left sitting. It's as simple as that. It's very obvious, actually. Should we move on? Yes. Let's move on to uh, our energy use. On a per capita basis, Canadians are the 10th highest energy users in the world. Much of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Does your party have a plan to reduce energy use 
and our reliance on fossil fuels. Chris, let's start with you. Absolutely, that's a fundamental pillar of the Green Party. Um, we are going to tackle this on a couple different levels. Uh, on the personal level, uh, just at the through home use, uh, we're going to introduce a tax incentives to help retrofit homes to make them more energy efficient. Once again, this is a win-win-win because we lower our energy costs, we lower the amount of money that we spend, and at the same time, we create jobs. Um, once again, the focus is on energy efficiency with this. And Elizabeth? Uh, our program would be quite similar, but since our focus is on animals, when we talk about energy and the environment and so on, we would be talking about, we would focus on, on animals and factory farming and so on, and not so much fuel. We would definitely be very, we're completely against the continuing use of fossil fuel, and we are uh, very much in favor of, of all the green options that there are, as solar, uh, wind, and so on, appropriately uh, exercised in the various regions of the country, absolutely. Julie. We have committed $20 billion to public transit infrastructure across this country. Cities are the largest CO2 emitters. <laughs> we need to find ways to get people off of the roads and to be able to use public transit system properly. That is one large way that we will do it. We will end fossil fuel subsidies we will attend the Paris conference and then we will sit down with the premiers and the territorial representatives to find ways to meet the targets met at that conference. And Craig? The NDP has had a uh, bill called the Climate Change Accountability Act before Parliament on <coughs> four occasions. It was first introduced by Jack Layton in 2007 uh, with, with targets that now include 80 percent below 1990 uh, green emission uh, greenhouse gas emissions levels by the year 2050. Uh, Environmental Defense and Equiterre in Quebec have compared the plans of the uh, four parties and said, in fact, the NDP has the most aggressive carbon emissions reductions targets of any of the of the parties. Uh, it's one of the most serious commitments Tom Mulcair brings to uh, his leadership and w and w he will be bringing as prime minister. And he will not be going to Paris with a bunch of premiers in tow with no plan. He'll be going with a plan. All right, let's open this up for debate. I think that's greenwashing. I think that you're saying at one point we have a strong environmental program, but at the same time you support pipelines. How can you possibly support pipelines and say at the same time that you are environmentally conscious? You're talking about expanding the infrastructure for the uh, fossil fuel industry. Um, right now the stance, and I believe you would say that we would look at the reports, the environmental studies, etc., but we all know that no report is going to come back and say, you know what, it's okay to blow a pipeline through for First Nations territory against their will. You know, there's no report that's going to say pipelines are safe. I'd also just like to add in, in that that the you are also missing the biggest polluter of all, which is factory farming and methane. The, me the methane produced by factory farms is far worse than <coughs> anything else. If everybody it, it's if it's between cars and factory farming, cars will do less harm than methane. And, and factory farming. So that is not, it isn't just an animal issue in the sense of animal cruelty and so on. And it is also a huge uh, environmental issue that you must, and this is what I hope that if I'm speaking to you as well as voters, mm -hmm. that, 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 that that factory farming, um, the, their powerful corporate uh, entities, yes, but they must, be, they must be eliminated and they must be replaced with small, local farmers, organic farmers, and, and we must reconsider our use of meat as well. well I think you're, by bringing up methane, you've done us all a service because it is one of the most lethal, if you, yes. in the sense of the greenhouse gases. Yes. And so it's actually included in the, uh, our, our Climate Change Accountability Act. It's greenhouse gases, not just carbon. Our, our carbon pricing system that we're planning to introduce that's pan-Canadian with no gaps and that will have adaptability for whatever provinces are already doing. Uh, is about carbon, but the overall act is, is all about uh, greenhouse gas emissions generally. And it's not just animals. I mean, the animal, uh, industrial animal emissions is a huge issue, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. Uh, but what's going on in the Arctic right now, unlocking of methane due to the effects yeah, the of climate change, is the permafrost is, is, yeah. is melting, yeah. methane is starting to seep out, and mm -hmm. uh, the worst of vicious circles is happening. Yes. The kind of challenge Canada would have to actually meet uh, our targets, uh, if we take some responsibility for what's happening on that front too, 
it, challenge is not the word. It's it's uh, it's almost uh, uh, almost impossible to imagine how we can um, we can stop what's happening in the Arctic in a way that will actually stop that particular release of methane. So we're aware of it. I have no idea whether or not. Uh, there are tried and true ways to address that, but it would just put pressure, more and more pressure on everything else we do that emits uh, greenhouse gases. You mentioned cap and trade, and I think that is a big concern for us because we know that cap and trade has not worked. We also know that cap and trade is a very complex system. It's very admin heavy. And we also know there's a reason that the oil industry has called for a cap and trade system. And it's because they know, quite frankly, it can be punked. It's easy and it's complex enough. There are so many layers that it can be easily be worked around. The Green Party has an incredibly precise program called fee and dividends. And fee and dividends would not only lower the um, carbon emissions, but at the same time, it would also boost the economy. It is a win-win on so many okay. levels. The problem that we have is that we've had a federal government over the past many years who has not sat down with our premiers to work towards targets and to create workable systems. And so we have had provinces creating their own systems. So cap and trade and carbon tax have been options chosen by different provinces. And so to, cre to ask these provinces to now dismantle their systems and to work with a new administrative system that we impose, it, it's, it's working backwards. So they have systems that they have been working towards. We can set targets, we can work with them. And, and actually reach the targets that we need to reach. But then you get a mashup of all these different systems. Some will be strong, some yeah. will be weak. And what will happen is industry in the provinces where they do have strong targets will say, look, we're gonna just move elsewhere and suddenly every, there's pressure to lower it and it's just gonna be a race to the bottom. You have to have universality. Yeah. Well, we have to have accountability and we have, to have, so we have to have trust in our systems. And that's something that we've been lacking. We've been just lacking having trust and accountability from our governments, from our, from our environmental assessments, and that is, that's what has been causing so much difficulty in dealing with environmental issues, and is that we haven't had the evidence, we haven't had the science, we haven't had the data, we just haven't been placed with the information to feel like decisions are being made in a way that gives us confidence. The well, we have it though because the, uh, the, the federal government has suppressed the scientists and it has shrunk the research or collapsed it at a time when, uh, when climate deniers are, you know, it sh sh are obviously in the scientific teeny minority and so on. They've been given credence by our government. And I think that bringing up the uh, warming of the permafrost is really important because it's a, it's a, it's, it is going to, no matter what the uh, climate de deniers say, climate change deniers, it's going to just create a horrible scenario that, that gets worse and worse. And it's, it's something that we should focus on, not because we necessarily know what to do now, because it's not just linked with that. We can't go up and cool it down. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, obviously, a global phenomenon. But to use it to show people how, how urgent the situation is mm -hmm. and how, as you say, we must focus on the things that we can do, that we, the, the methane emissions that we can control right away, right now, and explain why. They will start seeing why when there are way more hurricanes and way more uh, horrible weather events, as we call one, them. One aspect, I don't know if we still have time on sure. this question. Um, uh, Julie brought up public transit. Um, the, there are so many other ways to think about, it's not just a, a carbon pricing system and it's not just about um, uh, whether or not one can actually have a mishmash as, as Chris said, it's also how are we going to get to the, the green infrastructure, the green technology, uh, all the other things that contribute to a generally increasingly clean economy. Uh, so one of the things the NDP uh, is proposing, I'm not sure if the other parties are, they might be actually, is uh, a green bond system where up to 4.5 billion dollars in investments will be made in green technology and and green infrastructure from the federal government but where the money coming in is is financed through a bond offer mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a it's a its own way of creating upfront infrastructure spending uh, in a way that the uh, the liberals are talking about when they talk about just taking money from the general revenue in order to deficit fund um, the same kinds of ideas and infrastructure. And I'm not sure there's not an awful lot of difference between them. Um, we will be bringing back the green retrofit program that was very, very successful. Um, lots of people wanting their homes to be uh, uh, less, um, 
much less emitting of, uh, of, um, uh, of carbon and uh, uh, leakers of heat, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's lots of things, I think, that if you look across the three platforms, I'm not sure about the Animal Alliance's platform, that suggest that you know if we work together, mm -hmm. an awful lot can be done, but an awful lot has to be done. We're frankly in the greatest crisis uh, the world has ever known. It's I keep calling it a challenge, but it's actually a crisis. We're on the edge of a cliff, and if something major uh, doesn't give in terms of global cooperation and leadership from countries that may call themselves small emitters, that our percentage is small compared to the big emitters, if we don't show leadership, nobody else will, and uh, future generations will pay the price. Could I just clarify, Art, the role of the uh, Animal Alliance Environment Voters Party is clearly not going to be to form a government, but mm -hmm. it's to act as a conscience mm -hmm. and to keep those of you who form the government, uh, whether it's one of you three, the parties of one of you three, on point on these environmental issues, because so we are an environmental party as well. I think it's also important to talk about the fact that uh, the, the economy and the environment are not exclusive. Mm -hmm. They work together. Uh, we have a program where we're going to spend a billion dollars uh, a year on a green technology fund. And what that will do is that will invest in new technology. If you look at Germany, Germany has, I believe, 11% of its GDP comes from clean technology. It employs 1.4 billion people, a million people. Uh, this is incredibly powerful this is the direction that we need to be in. And if we want to be a powerful country that uh, generates wealth for our citizens, the answer is not in fossil fuel. The answer is in clean technology. I'm, I'm going to agree that what we need to do is diversify our economy. And, and when we're looking at diversifying our economy, developing sustainable technologies is a great way to do it because it's exactly that, the marriage between the environment and developing our economy, creating jobs. Mm -hmm. And so you know, building trade missions to actually create more exports for our sustainable technologies, using our government resources to help develop sustainable technologies and to encourage the development of those businesses. Those are all things that we can do and we must consider the economy and the environment together as we go forward. I would like to say our party wishes to, re to reconceive of the economy. We believe in a steady state economy in which there is balance, that the whole model of endless progress and growth is not sustainable. It's got us into the mess that we're in now. Steady state believes in balance, that you, you do not consume more than you generate so that you are not depleting the, uh, you are not depleting the natural resources and so on, that it is all balanced, that you, if you don't have weight, you don't have endless population growth, can think of it in a way as yin and yang or something like that, that it, but it's balanced and it's controlled because the biosphere, biosphere is a given and we all operate within it and we're part of it. And when we try to impose economic models from books that are completely crazy and have brought us into this, as, as Craig said, this absolutely crisis ridden uh, situation, the cliff that we're about to go over if we don't smarten up, steady state economy is definitely the, the, the only way to look at the economy and to work from that perspective. But I think uh, if I can just add that it all comes down to pipelines, because pipelines are a powerful, powerful symbol. It's a symbol of broadening and building the uh, fossil fuel industry. And right now we're sitting here with one party that, that supports two pipelines, another party that supports, I believe, four or five. And this has to stop. We have to put, put, put a stop to that. Uh, Chris, you're being a little <coughs> bit, I, I, w I won't go into any further debate, but <laughs> the, the idea, which I, I don't know which pipelines you're saying we're supporting. We're supporting a complete re, uh, renewal and overhaul of the environmental assessment process. You do know, because we've been at debates where I've said before, that includes our international obligations on carbon emissions, and it includes the fact that if you cannot meet those obligations while allowing those pipelines to operate, the pipelines will not be approved. Will you say no to Kinder Morgan, and will you say no to Energy East? These are uh, after the environmental assessments. The, you ask you feel that. it needs to be. Yeah. It needs to go before yeah, review. If you want, you if won't you, take if a if strong you, stand and if, say if, no. If you if, if you want to prejudge the scientific assessment, you can go ahead. But the fact of the matter is, you're probably right when you say that uh, when you look at the size of the the pipelines and their contributions, not just to local pollution but to carbon emissions. The chances that they will be approved is probably pretty low. You, you are a strong environmentalist. I know that you have. have, have you believe in this. Why mm -hmm. won't you just say 
why won't you just say? Let's because move on, uh, because shall I'm we? not an expert to know actually what the final result is. Because you, it's political strategy, and you want to make sure you hold on to the West. I want to talk to you about the Syrian refugee crisis that has become mm. a big issue in this election, mm. and we have seen governments around the world respond in many different ways. What stance should Canada take on this issue? Let's start with you, Julie. Well, there are many things that we should do. This, this crisis has been brewing for quite a long time. It isn't new. It's become more front page news recently. Mm -hmm. But in fact, all the way back in the spring, members of the Liberal Party were asking for us to bring, for the country to allow more government-sponsored Syrian refugees to enter this country. And, and now, now it's reached a point where we're all looking at it more carefully. We want to have government-sponsored refugees, 25,000 more, brought immediately to put money into proper processing of the applications and to put money into the UNHCR so that we can help refugees on the ground. Thank you. Chris? We believe that we also have to take some responsibility for this crisis. As the West, we have taken a very aggressive stance. Um, we need to, I think, start to focus on peacekeeping and on aid, not on be taking an aggressive stance that bombs many countries and in many cases helps create some of these issues that we have. We also have to look at the Syrian crisis as a very complex issue. A lot of it has been caused by climate change because there was a drought there. People were fighting over food as well. So we have to look at it at all sides. We welcome refugees. Uh, we have a plan to bring in 25,000 because it's our duty and it's our responsibility to do okay, so. Okay, Craig? Um, I think the policies are very, very uh, similar. Uh, in fact, my own involvement goes back uh, over 18 months, the uh, spring of 2014 when I began to meet with um, some embryonic groups forming in Mississauga. Uh, trying to figure out how to increase the private sponsorships of uh, bringing people over. This crisis didn't just start this summer with the imagery that we saw on the beaches of Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it helped us figure out what kinds of questions to be asking in the House of Commons and to reveal that the government, in fact, was playing fast and loose with the facts. They were trying to get, uh, make people believe that 10,000 um, Syrian fa uh, Syrians had already come when in fact it was Iraqis. They were basically playing very fast and loose and trying to make people think that the government was, was committed to sponsoring 10,000 with their own money. When well, it let's, let's let Elizabeth yeah. have her say for 30 seconds. When in, and fact, then we'll it was when in fact it was only 8,000 would be private sponsorship. So the fact is the government has not been up front. I think that when we look at the Syrian crisis as if it's just the Syrian crisis we're really talking about, we, uh, we have been terrified by the fact that so many Syrians uh, are among the refugees who have, have, have uh, gone into Europe and are trying to uh, emigrate to Europe. In fact, I think that what that should do is call our attention to the fact that there are hundreds of millions of internally displaced refugees throughout the world, especially Africa, the Middle East, and, 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 and in, now it's in, in any country that's mm -hmm. suffering drought. And that we should, when we realize that, we realize that this is, this is a tiny pr crisis compared to the one right. that's about ready to explode on us. Well, and so you all agree that we need to bring more yeah. refugees into our country. How do we do that? Let's open this up for debate now. Well, I think it's fairly important to know that uh, those who are familiar with both the logistics and past uh, episodes, whether it's Joe Clark talking about when he was prime minister or it's now Rick Hillier, the former uh, head of our armed forces, talking about how very feasible it is to do this in a very short period of time. Um, you simply have to have the political will and the effectiveness at the military and diplomatic level and the immigration processing level will all fall into place. It really has been a problem of a lack of political will. Mm -hmm. <coughs> We need to make sure that we can work with people too. I know that there are local groups even within the Toronto Danforth riding who have been trying to privately sponsor families, mm -hmm. Syrian families, and have run into tremendous difficulties in doing so. Yeah. So you know, when they actually get a list of people who they can sponsor, there are no Syrian families on the list. Now there are other refugees who also need to come to our country and, and so I know that at least one group has decided that they would take someone from another country, and, that, and that's great too. But we need to be looking at how we process people and make sure that we have that, that availability, creating the capacity, because people do want to help. Mm -hmm. And it's just about allowing them to do that. We, we've opened our arms. We also have to make sure that we 
uh, have the services in place so that once people do arrive in Canada that they're looked after and that they're given a fair chance to to excel um, we have issues with housing we have issues with poverty that we need to uh, make sure that we deal with as well before we bring people so things like a guaranteed livable income which is something that the Green Party would like to bring in would help everyone uh, we have a very strong housing program to make sure that not only will it help the people who are here but also that when we have refugees and new Canadians come and join us that everybody is given a fair opportunity mm -hmm. to thrive and I my point is that uh, when these hundreds of millions of climate refugees are forced out of as they are being forced out of their homelands into wherever they can go begin to uh, to, to, to expand it into our comfort level we, we should we can't take them all because they are the whole world practically mm -hmm. and what we're going to have what we should be doing now apart from all the measures that uh, have been discussed of bringing those refugees in uh, you know a, a substantial number of refugees in now is help the people who are suffering drought and so on and they need so they need so much help and they need they need reforestation and they need all sorts of specific concrete measures so that the whole world won't become a desert with all of the, with everybody coming to the few remaining uh, third world uh, first world countries that have uh, that still have so somewhat of a of a green uh, nature so i think that it's it's a dual pro it's not just when there's a crisis as there is now in Europe, to start saying, oh my God, we've got to bring Syrians. It's to look at all the other hundreds of millions. It's about to happen. It's, it's just like the methane, uh, uh, um, the uh, permafrost uh, uh, warming. It's happening. And we can't just wait until it's happened. And all of a sudden in Europe, there's a hundred million Africans or something. And, and then we say, oh my God, w w how did that happen? Well, it's happening already. And we just, as long as they stay there and they don't bother us, we, we don't care. We have to care now. We have to do something now. Well, as you say, we bring refugees in. We've got to have the support system in place. We have to have the infrastructure. So let's move on now to that question. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities says that countrywide, there's a $123 billion municipal infrastructure deficit. Here in Ontario, the GTA is the fastest growing region of the province with its population projected to reach over 9 million by 2041. However, increasing traffic congestion, crumbling expressways and overtaxed utilities lead critics to say that our urban infrastructure is not keeping pace with this growth. Massive infrastructure projects typically involve funding and cooperation between all three levels of government. Where will we find the money for this essential work and how will your party approach this crucial issue? Let's start with you, Craig. <coughs> Um, this is something we've actually been working with the FCM on uh, for quite some time and they knew in advance what we were announcing in the campaign uh, uh, was coming. And our approach is that on, on core infrastructure we should be setting long-term reliable uh, and sustainable approaches to f uh, federal funding coming into the city so cities know how to plan against and maybe even borrow money against um, the incoming federal money. So we've talked about, we're going to have a 20 year infrastructure funding plan that continuously goes up for 20 years and FCM has actually endorsed that plan. Elizabeth. Um, I guess the cr I see the crumbling infrastructure, my party is, is obviously not, hasn't created a specific plan for that because we're not going to form the government. But uh, the crumbling infrastructure is North American wide because we have Municipal politics has up until recently, and maybe, maybe, maybe this is even wrong, they have been very corrupt, and contra as in Montreal, we're just see still seeing instances of that, and I'm sure we could find them in Toronto, so that there is so much badly, badly built, badly constructed, badly conceived infrastructure, and, um, and, and a lot of it, we're, t we're trying to fix it, and we should maybe be rethinking it. I mean, the whole issue of suburbs, for example, that are continue to swallow mm -hmm. up really good farmland and so on. All of these issues are, are uh, should be addressed now. Okay, let's move on to Chris. 
Uh, we will work with all three levels of government, including um, First Nations governments and Aboriginal governments, uh, to bring together a, an investment in infrastructure that would equal $6.4 billion. This will be clean uh, technology infrastructure, so and uh, clean uh, um, infrastructure in total. So it would deal with things such as traffic issues, home renovations. It would also include uh, bike um, bike lanes right. that would help and bike infrastructure. There's an awful lot that we can do by spending this money. Not only will it stimulate the economy, but also at the same time, it will help make uh, Toronto a much cleaner society. And Julie? Um, our plan is to make the largest historical new investment in infrastructure. And we propose $20 billion towards public transit investments across this country. $20 billion towards social infrastructure, which includes affordable housing, which is an important part of the infrastructure to our communities and First Nations communities that needs to be invested in, and $20 billion in green infrastructure. So when we're in Toronto and we watch the rain just wash through the city and right into Lake Ontario, that's something we need to fix. It's crumbling and we need to have a plan for it. We hear a lot of big numbers being thrown around here. Why don't you guys debate just how realistic these numbers are? Our plan is realistic because we have set out a fully costed plan that has been set out exactly how we plan to get there to fund all of this. We will be running a deficit for a few years, but interest rates are low, so this is the right time to do it. And the infrastructure needs to be repaired. We're going to have to do it, mm -hmm. so this is the time. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the problems with the Liberals' approach is that, is that infrastructure rollout actually takes planning, coordination and the issue of most of the spending that they're talking about in the deficit years of, of the next three years, $26 billion in deficits on this, is going to be sort of putting the pressure on the municipalities to say, uh, come up with your projects now, make sure they're as green as possible, they're green enough that they're going to be green in 20 years from now, and, and somehow or other foster, uh, bring everything together ma to make sure it's all done within the three or four year period. Mm -hmm. um, well, what, no, FC, what, what, F, what, F, what FCM... I need to correct that because mm -hmm. it's actually a plan over 10 years That's of over reliable time, but you, funding. But you but are pumping your whole message, Julie, is vote for us because we're spending so much money so early. You started your, your talk by saying vote for us because things will happen immediately. The well, point, the point is that the, municip now. the municipalities have to know that they can plan things on their schedule and that in year six, year seven, year eight, when new green infrastructure and, and, and technology okay. comes online, when they're ready to be doing it, that's when they can do it versus saying, oh, the money was available in the first three years and somehow or other we, we weren't ready. That's we what's going to happen. We have specifically said that the money mm. wouldn't lapse if not spent. We've actually specifically addressed that and mm. we have we plan for a reliable, steady source of funding well, the over 10 years. The problem years is you guys are caught over a barrel because you started with the, the whole rationale for the uh, $26 billion in deficit spending initially was, ah, we're in a recession. Trudeau backed off of that because it was a rather uh, unsustainable claim that we're in the kind of recession that requires stimulus spending. We're not. So therefore, you shift it to saying all this money has to be needed now for uh, infrastructure spending reasons. The, the, the fact of the matter is you want that money out the door as a political spending cycle for the first three years before an election comes up in the fourth year. You want yep. that money spent. You want that money for photo opportunities. You want that money to be already out the door. The idea of it lapsing... Uh, but that, that's yeah. not true. So, for yeah. example, when we talk about affordable housing, mm -hmm. we talk about also refurbishing and maintaining available housing units that are there in our oh, social housing system. There is no photo opportunity with that. It just mm. makes sense. No, but the so, point... No, but, yeah. but what you are saying mm. is absolutely untrue, is that we plan, and, and we know that the economy mm. has been stagnant. People need to get jobs. We need to give a kickstart to the economy. When we talk about our mm. infrastructure investment plan, we are clear it's about a way of creating more jobs for while at the same time investing in the future of our country. For and three we years. need to know, no, over 10 years of, of proposed spending and with creating a steady for source of funding. The spending spree funding. is three years, okay? And you don't actually fix a broken economy by throwing money at it. It's a recessionary philosophy, Keynesian philosophy applies to a recessionary environment where you actually, any money being spent anywhere helps. 
The that idea of throwing money uh, out the door after three for for three years. Uh, on the idea that somehow or other this is going to create jobs. What happens to those jobs when that money, that $26 billion in spending, uh, drops off and you have a trickle afterwards? Well, it, it's not a trickle. It's not a, it's uh, not no, a it's trickle cuts. and it's, it's better cuts. than coming up with, it's better than saying that you will balance the budgets while promising to do all sorts of spending because well, that is impossible. Here, here, that cannot be done. Here's one of the deceits of the liberal ads. They keep talking about Thomas Mulcair is going to balance Stephen Harper's budget, which is craziness because we're bringing in more revenue uh, than From Stephen where? Harper and oh you ask uh, by, by getting rid of the TFSAs by getting rid of income in. splitting by taxing corporations uh, an extra two percent we have a much bigger budget pie you can balance budgets and make your priorities work when you have more money to spend and we'll be bringing more money in on the revenue side than the Liberals so the idea that uh, Justin Trudeau goes up on TV and ta talks about a balancing Stephen Harper's budget is a deliberate deceit. That's not what we're doing. It's not a deliberate deceit. It is. It's and absolutely a deceit. We have a fully costed plan that we've set out. That's where all the numbers are. And Elizabeth, could I, could I just point out in? that it, it, one way that we should be getting, any government should be getting way more money, is by corporations that are offshoring. Uh, the, the, the amount of money that we're not getting from huge corporations that are hardly paying anything is staggering. And the other thing is, it, all mm. this money that's going into infrastructure is actually in construction, which is, in, which is uh, an, a, an economic activity that has been fraught with corruption. I mean, that's, that's how it's been run. And I would really hope that, that, that these plans are all, are all accompanied by a, a way, a, by real authority, moral authority, ombudsman and ac accountability um, offices and so on so that that corruption doesn't uh, yet again uh, continue on in, into these new projects. Chris? Yeah, I, I think really your question is where are you going to get the cash? That's what it boils down to. And Canada is a very rich country. It all depends on where we choose to spend the money. Right now, we support <laughs> the oil industry. Um, the IMF said, I think it was at $32 billion that we're supporting the oil industry. We're buying fighter jets, um, which don't work and we don't need. We're wasting money left, right, and center. This, we have to decide where is the priority. Where is the priority? The priority should be in the environment. It should be in poverty reduction. It should be in quality. Um, at the end of the day, the Green Party has a fully costed program. You can go online and see line by line. Unlike other programs, I know with the NDP, uh, Kevin Page, um, the former par uh, parliamentary budget chief, uh, referred to it as Swiss cheese. It has holes in it. The NDP is counting on oil uh, being at a very high price, which is unrealistic, and others are saying that it's just not going to happen. And at the end of the day, we shouldn't be counting on selling oil as the way that we're going to be able to fund a lot of our promises. I don't know anything about the um, the costing of the Liberals. I haven't heard that you've had it fully costed. Um, I would be interested in seeing how you actually break that down. If we can move on, we're actually running out of time, but we do have time for one more question. Let's let's move on to the fortunes of our young people. Mm. More than 42% of young Canadians currently live with their parents in comparison to 26% who did so in 1980. Student debt remains at an all-time high and many young people struggle to establish themselves in a career. What measures can government take to improve the prospects of young Canadians? Maybe Chris, your turn. And stick to 30 seconds if you don't mind. Free tuition. Uh, free tuition by 2020. Other countries can do it. Why can't we? There's no reason for us not to be able to. Uh, until then, we're going to cap student loans at $10,000 and we are going to eliminate interest. Um, there's no reason that by the time that a young person leaves university or college that they shouldn't be able to be in the position where they can thrive and start the life that they want to. My kids will be happy to hear that. I would also yeah. think <laughs> that w one of the, the, a crucial thing is that they can't get in, in large numbers the good jobs that they used to be able to get to, mm -hmm. so that now these kids are living at home because they can't get permanent jobs, they don't, they lack security, they lack benefits, mm -hmm. and I think that we should bring the, I'm sorry, the TPP into this because it is almost certainly going to redu going to eliminate a lot of good jobs and replace them with the sort of awful jobs and lowly paid insecure jobs that are putting our children, uh, infantilizing them or keeping them, putting them in a state of insecurity and near, near poverty so that they have to live with their parents. Uh, uh, Julie. 
there are two parts. We've talked about tuition, so we would be um, increasing the number of student loans and the parameters for who would be eligible. And then also that students, as soon as they finish school, do not have to start paying those loans because that is one of the hardest things right out of school. So mm -hmm. at the point when they start earning $25,000 or more, they could start paying their student loans, but they would have a period to defer. But we also need to create jobs through more co-op placements, summer jobs, and more opportunities to build that part of our economy. This is, may okay. I just, ooh, sorry. Just give him his 30 seconds and okay. then we'll move on to the debate. Okay. So, uh, I just wanted to add one perspective, which is the single biggest uh, uh, demographic um, in Canada that's growing in terms of children uh, that will soon become adults is the, our Aboriginal uh, uh, communities. And uh, what's happening there is that we need to make sure that those communities as a whole uh, are healthy as possible. And it's, we've had a travesty for the last uh, number of decades. We just announced today a, a, a new approach that will include uh, almost $5 billion um, uh, over the next eight years that will go towards eliminating the education funding disparity that already exists between Aboriginal communities and the rest okay. of Canada. Elizabeth, you wanted to jump in? I did because uh, what the, the, the thought that when you finally get to make $25,000 a year that you can start paying student debt, is ridiculous. Uh, you, can, you can't even live on $25,000 in a, in a Canadian city, or at least not in Toronto. No. And then that you should be on, on top of it required to pay student debt is so crushing to these student spirits and so on. It's a, it's a terrible benchmark. It's not possible. Right now, people have to pay debt immediately coming out of school. And so we have a two-part problem, which is paying down the debt, but also making sure that we have opportunities for our students who are graduating, we need to create more jobs. And that is where we're funding, we're putting funding towards subsidizing co-op placements so that they can get work experience that is paid for. We are putting money towards creating more summer jobs, again, to create those work experiences, internship opportunities. We need to start looking at ways to create more jobs for our young people because beyond the debt issue, it's about moving forward. You know, government shouldn't be creating jobs because those are s jobs are civil servants' jobs. They should be creating environments in which people who know how to cre have, have businesses and so on and industries can create jobs. And one of the first things that should be done in order to protect our youth is to is to is to repeal or to withdraw our signature to the TPP, which is guaranteed. To, to, to make it much worse than it is now, so that a that $25,000 secure job would start <coughs> looking good, that we are impoverishing our children with this, uh, with this, this uh, agreement that is still secret to most of us. We have not been, we the Canadian people have not been privy to most of its, uh, um, its, its measures. Uh, lobbyists have been, but not us. And, but what we do know is that we're surrendering our sovereignty, we're surrendering our, our right to, to create a good legislation, to, to maintain good legislation uh, uh, regarding our, um, our workers and so on, because this, these are the provisions that corporations from somewhere else can come and sue our government for doing things that are counterproductive to the profitability of those foreign uh, corporations. These things are, are what we should be doing, it's much more important than trying to, quote, create jobs because you can't create jobs Does if you're everyone government. agree about the TPP? Uh, yeah, just moving before we get into the TPP, uh, just to go back to, to the question, I, I think it's important that we also look at some of uh, the bold policies. And I mentioned bold policies, and one of them is a guaranteed livable income. And that would have a huge impact on not just young people, everyone, but particularly young people. That would give everyone a cushion that would basically live, lift everyone out of poverty. So a young student, somebody who is struggling, they don't have to worry about ever falling below the poverty line. It's uh, something that has been proven to work, it's been tested in, uh, in Canada, it's been tested in other countries, and it is embraced by people on both the right and the left. Judy Rebick embraces it and Andrew Coyne embraces it. Mm -hmm. So the guaranteed livable income would have a tremendous impact on the young people today. As for the TPP, yes, we were uh, one of the first to come out against it. There's a reason that it's been negotiated in secret. Um, we, uh, we can't go there and we've been um, very 
clear that uh, we can't usurp our court systems, we can't usurp our um, sovereignty for what isn't even a trade deal. It's and an Julie, investment your deal. thoughts on TPP? We don't know the details to the agreement, so it's very hard to reach an, you know, an opinion one way or another as to we, we need to get the details, and that is exactly the problem that we had, is that this has been negotiated in the dark. And then we need to have a full debate, and, the com and, and Canadians need to look at this agreement and decide whether it's a good one. But we can't, we can't reach those types of decisions until we know what's in it. Craig, we just have a minute left. Yeah, with, with the TPP, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's no particular reason to have any confidence that it's uh, an agreement that's good for Canada, given how it's been negotiated, um, and given that we know it's not even actually finalized. Stephen Harper's playing the same trick he did with CETA. He's trying to present the idea that something has been negotiated and Canada's in the middle of it, and it's a big triumph. And in fact, there's a 90-day period during which more negotiations are still going on. Um, it, it's, it's really an election ploy. And uh, we've said clearly, we, we will not be bound in any way, even by the signature on the document, which has a little bit of legal force in international law. We're not going to be bound by it. Although, of course, if we had a conservative candidate here, there would be another <laughs> argument. No, um, there would just be some talking points. There's no argument. <laughs> And yet, you know, it's an, it's an important step to increasing, you know, our, our trade with other countries. I mean, you know, it, it, almost, it almost seems like it would be moving backwards to, to, to not. There's so many things that will be in it. We, we're now finding out that it will have uh, major impacts on the internet because of uh, overly uh, uh, strong copyright protections that will mean that creativity will be, um, will be stifled. There's now going to be a clause that people are uh, thinking, but again, the secrecy means we don't know. That means corporations yeah. can move data offshore uh, within the zone so that the uh, privacy laws in Canada will no longer apply. It's not just about what you think of as trade. There's a bunch okay. of other things. Craig, we've got to move on yeah. now to our closing statements, and we are going to go in the opposite order uh, that we began. Uh, that means we're going to start with Elizabeth Abbott and you have 30 seconds. Well, I would like to say that first of all, I would urge people to look at all the candidates positions and to vote. It is such a crucial period in the life of Canada, uh, in the world, and you have a, a chance to go and elect good representatives this time uh, in Parliament. Please go out and vote. And I would also then say, those of you who have animals at home, sit down now, and as you do that, pet your dog, stroke your cat, and think about Animal Alliance and the Environment Voters Party. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Chris Stolle. Every vote says something about who you are and what you believe in. A vote for the Green Party says that you are against pipelines. It says that you are against Bill C-51. And it says that you are against party politics. It also says that you are for real action on climate change, on truly compassionate treatment for refugees, and on a very strong pharma care program. Please help me send that message. Please help me send that message by voting green. Thank you. Thank you very much. Julie. I'm Julie DeBrusson, and I have a track record of delivering real change in Toronto Danforth. I work with local food banks, parks, and schools, and what I see from all that great work happening in our community is that we can do better. We need a federal partner. And I am asking for your vote so that I can be your federal partner in Ottawa. You can count on me to represent your interests. Vous pouvez compter sur moi pour représenter vos intérêts. And you can count on me to say the same thing in English and in French. <laughs> Vous pouvez compter sur moi à dire même chose en français et en anglais. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. And Craig. Okay, you, you've, you've just noticed uh, what the Liberals call their positive campaigning. That's actually another uh, untruth coming from the Liberals about Tom Mulcair saying different things in two languages. It's been absolutely disproved. Uh, please uh, keep me in mind. Uh, you know what my record for the last three years. And if you want to go forward for a very positive future of, for Canada with proportional representation, uh, real fight against climate change, uh, repeal of Bill C-51, and a real national child care program, please vote for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig Scott. And a quick mention before we go of the registered candidates that did not attend tonight, Benjamin Dichter and John Richardson. Thank you so much for joining us on The Local Campaign.
Airtimes for other debates can be found on rogerstv.com. I'm Pam Seidel. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.